Just before his first fight with Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier was in the locker room and he prayed and he said, God, please help me kill Muhammad Ali for he's not a righteous man. And this is an incredible mentality to have. Frazier wasn't trying to pump himself up for the fight here. This man legitimately wanted his opponent to die. And this mentality would last throughout decades. This was a constant point of conflict and tension for Frazier until he died. And after Muhammad Ali had already apologized um it, it was an apology that Frazier could just never accept and when you watch that fight when you watch what came to be known as the fight of the century you can see it you can see it in Frazier's eyes you could see it in his punches you could see it in the way he moved you could see it in the way that he looked at Ali that he was there to legitimately hurt and maybe kill and like I said before this carried on throughout the entirety of his life um, when Muhammad Ali went to light the Olympic torch walking forward uh, trying to manage his Parkinson's disease shaking Joe Frazier said immediately after that he wished that he had fallen in to the flames <laughs> And that uh, if he were there, he would have pushed him in. Frazier, in fact, referenced Ali's Parkinson's as um, proof that he won all three encounters. Basically saying something along the lines of, Well, yeah, my face may have been more busted up, and my, I may have lost two out of three, but look at who did the most damage. Look at me, I can, I can still talk and I can still move. And it's easy to paint Frazier as kind of a villain in the way that he's behaving. And uh, personally, I feel that, of course, that is going way too far. Um, but Frazier had his reasons. And so that's what we're going to kind of look at in this podcast. So I think the best way to kind of summarize what happened between these two was that it was this intermixing of uh, the climate of the times, of, of a conflict deeply embedded in American, American society at the time, and it was mixed in and, it, it, and became intertwined with the personal relationship between these two great heavyweight champions. And for Frazier, it, be it began to deeply impact his family and his children, the things that Ali was saying, and, and kind of crept into his own psyche to where he got this seething hatred towards Muhammad Ali. And for Ali, um, Frazier, it wasn't so much personal, except that Frazier was in the way of what Ali considered to be his cause. And so it was it was kind of like this cultural idealist war that Muhammad Ali was waging was having a personal effect on Frazier and Frazier for Ali was just in the way. He was a person in the way of this uh of this cultural shift that he was trying to help move forward. And what resulted was the greatest rivalry in boxing probably i you could say combat sports and maybe all of sports the result was a trilogy of fights with many considering the first to be one of the most epic fights of all time the second to be very very good but not near as impactful or exciting as the other two and the third to be one of the most amazing conclusions to a rivalry of all time and before we, we get into kind of the exact blow by blow of what happened between these guys and their respective sides and what each of them was fighting for, I think it's, it's good to take just a minute or so to think about martial arts as a whole 
whether you're learning it as a combat sport or whether you're learning it for self-defense, and maybe just kind of ask yourself and examine what exactly is it that you're fighting for and, and what are your exact limits. And I think this is really a question worth, uh, worth asking and not in a kind of arrogant, well, now I have the power, you know, to hurt people way. I, I study the blade, you know, I'm a total badass. I can just go in and now that my power is so great, I need to think about it, you know. It's more the fact that you are making a decision um, to learn how to hurt people. And if you're making a decision to learn how to hurt people, whether it's for self-defense, whether it's for glory, or uh, whether it's for, like, Muhammad Ali, a cause you believe in, or whether it's, like, Joe Frazier, um, a way to survive and thrive and create a better life for his family, or whether it's, like, Foreman, uh, to prove that he was just the baddest guy around, um, at least at the beginning of his career, I, I think it's something that's really worth deeply examining, and I think it's why martial arts is so intertwined in philosophy. And, of course... It used to be tied up in being uh, a warrior, actually an actual warrior, an actual soldier going to battle, and still is, of course, if you're entering any kind of army or armed forces. And the philosophy behind learning how to use force and why you use that force was interconnected deeply with the beliefs of that civilization and that society. So deeply intertwined in any kind of martial arts is the idea of there needs to be a reason for what we're learning and hopefully uh, you personally and your society considers that a righteous reason and gives a, a great deal of thought to what is and what is not righteous. The next kind of logical step for this is to take the ideals of your civilization or your society or your group or your culture and kind of tie them onto either specific warriors, whether it's entire armies or figureheads, like it was the um, generals or kings in ancient battles. If one of them fell, then it, oh no, my cause is not righteous or the other side's God is correct or stronger than my God. And these are very deep, ancient kind of Jungian uh, beliefs that seem to be inherent in civilizations from the dawn of time. And in, even modern day people kind of do this. They have a kind of trial by combat of ideals with one fighter representing one ideal and the other fighter representing the other. And at times the fighters really are for these causes, at times they're not. Muhammad Ali made very clear he was for certain causes. And Frazier, for his part, uh, did not want to be associated with one cause or the other. Frazier just wanted to fight. But whether he wanted it or not, during the fight of the century, Muhammad Ali had a very distinctive, clear message that he was trying to push, and the people for that message were with Muhammad Ali. And being with Muhammad Ali, they hated Frazier, loathed Frazier, uh, were disgusted, despised Frazier. And the people in the very same way who hated Muhammad Ali loved Joe Frazier, whether he wanted to champion their cause or not. And recently, public opinion has kind of held for the people who actually care about these things or, or, or have watched documentaries on it or, or um, have taken any kind of interest there's been this kind of story going on that's been framed as if Frazier was just minding his own business and Muhammad Ali decided to use him as a scapegoat against his cause. Which in many ways was true in the fact that Muhammad Ali did decide to paint Joe Frazier as a villain. But Frazier, for his part, always made his opinions very clear on the actions of Muhammad Ali and whether he wanted to be a representation 
of the pro-Vietnam, pro-draft, uh, and in some ways pro-racial inequality movement, uh, or not. That is what he became, and it was in part due to his own opinions that he had expressed about Muhammad Ali from the very beginning. There were two major decisions that were very important to Muhammad Ali that he made for himself and for the cause he chose to champion that Frazier just kind of did not go along with. He refuted them. First, Frazier refused to call Muhammad Ali by the name that he had chosen for himself, Muhammad Ali. He referred to him as Cassius Clay. It's really important to understand exactly why Muhammad Ali's new name was so important to him. It wasn't so much to do with him changing religions as it was that he felt that his name lacked any kind of cultural identity or heritage. A lot of African American surnames were names that were uh, forced upon them after their own names had been dis not just discouraged, but forbidden. And the names they were forced to take upon themselves were the names of the family that happened to have bought them and was enslaving them. So there was the fact that he considered it to be A, a slave name, and B, he makes the point in his book Soul of a Butterfly that if someone says Mr. Chow, um, you look for the Chinese guy. If someone says Mr. Weisenberg, you know it's going to most likely be a Jewish man. But if someone says Mr. Green, this is quoting from uh, Muhammad Ali's biography, Soul of a Butterfly, I quote, but if I said Mr. Green or Mr. Jones, the man could be black or white, because in slavery, we were named after a white person. He was our master, and we were his slaves. If his name was Robinson, we were Robinson's property, and therefore we were called by his last name. Our identity was determined by the names of our masters, and if we changed masters, our names changed too. So even my own name, Cassius Marcellus Clay, wasn't really my own. Cassius Marcellus Clay was a white man from Kentucky who owned slaves. So, I was named after a slave owner. And to me, my name represented hundreds of years of injustice and enslavement. End quote. I don't get into personal topics very often on the podcast, but just to give a kind of idea of how far-reaching this practice was, I just took a DNA test and found out that either my great-great-grandmother or my great-great-grandfather was African. And that happens to be the side that I get my surname from. So at this point, I'm left curious if the name Christian was actually the name of my ancestors, or if it was a name that was forced upon my ancestors by their masters named Christian. So it's a very wide-reaching sort of social phenomenon in America that Apparently, even blue-eyed, pale-skinned people might not know um, exactly where their surnames came from. Now, of course, that was just a semi-interesting side note, and I'm not claiming to share anything with the experiences that Muhammad Ali uh, or the people of that time had. But it does kind of help to emphasize the point of just how far-reaching the destruction of African culture was, and how far down through the generations it can kind of permeate. Uh, when, when Africans were shipped over to be slaves in America, it wasn't just, obviously, their names that they lost, and it wasn't just their freedom. They lost thousands of years of cultural identity. Their entire society, or diff varying different societies, depending on where they came from, was taken away from them forcibly. And it was Muhammad Ali's wish that he could become kind of an icon of a new form of African-American cultural identity. And in many ways, uh, and in many regards, that did end up coming true. But in many ways, that was also at the personal expense uh, of Joe Frazier. The fight of the century happened just 
a few years after the assassination of Martin Luther King, and only a few years after the Civil Rights Act. So from the very beginning, Joe Frazier had refused to call Muhammad Ali by his name, by his chosen name. And he had referred to him as Cassius and would continue to refer to him as Cassius Clay until his death in every single documentary that he had ever given. And this allowed Muhammad Ali to paint Joe Frazier as anti-civil rights. And, and this is a big one, especially for those times. It allowed him to paint Joe Frazier, and he did so effectively in the minds of many people, as a traitor to his own race in a time of massive racial tension. And Muhammad Ali himself has admitted that he went too far in doing this. And the impact that this had on Joe Frazier in his own community, in his own life, uh, was absolutely massive. He was hated, hated in his own community and amongst his own people. And I think what if you listen to what he says about the incidents, when you, if you hear him talk about it, what really got to him was his kids because his kids were being badly picked on and bullied in school. Uh, his kids basically went from hearing how their dad was a hero every day to hearing how their dad was evil, how their dad was a traitor, uh, and how they were traitors, and how their whole family was terrible, and a number of very terrible things, very bad things that I'm not going to say on the podcast. But uh, it, it was definitely a personal it had a massive personal effect on Frazier's entire family. And it's something that Muhammad Ali felt so much remorse for that he spent a lot of time talking about it in his book years later. But of course, back then, Ali wasn't thinking of that. He was thinking of his cause and he was thinking of himself. Once again, this is something that Frazier can't act entirely innocent on because he started the conflict but it was something that Muhammad Ali in my opinion uh, and in his own opinion took way too far so that was the first issue that developed this deep seething hatred that Frazier had of Muhammad Ali the second issue had to do with Muhammad Ali's refusal to go to the Vietnam War and was tied in and basically had the same exact effect and result as the first conflict about Muhammad Ali's name. Muhammad Ali refused to go into the Vietnam War for a number of reasons. Uh, the first was that he just simply didn't believe in the war. He didn't think we had a reason to be there, and he couldn't imagine himself killing other people, especially people he had no conflict with. So there was that. And the next issue for him was that he was deeply critical of the way that his people were not given equal rights or equal opportunities or equal um, treatment from his own government, yet his government wanted him to go over there and kill other people. He said, they want me to go kill other poor people, and I don't have any conflict with them. Uh, but there's, of course, his famous quote, uh, no uh, Viet Cong has ever called me a racially disparaging remark, which I just heavily edited, but you get the point. And so before we move forward, I want to clarify one thing, and that is that Muhammad Ali was in much more danger uh, and, and would go through much more hardship by refusing to be drafted. What generally happened with celebrities uh, and especially with heavyweight champions of the world or any kind of, uh, of famous boxer or accomplished boxers is that they'd go on, on these tours and they'd tour among the troops and they'd keep these guys out of the way of harm. Even if they asked to be put in harm's way, they would still be kept out of it. And it's very easy to imagine why a government might do this. Uh, because can you imagine the headline, 
Muhammad Ali killed in Nam, dead at age 27. Can you imagine the protests that would have happened over Ali being forced to go to Vietnam and then ending up dead? And, and uh, this isn't just true for Muhammad Ali, this is true for not really in a in a unrest kind of way, not really in a in a protesting or rioting or or angry at the government kind of way. But can you imagine how how disparaging it would be if one of your heroes goes overseas and is shot dead? What if they put uh, Joe Lewis, who volunteered to join the army and was um, was kept actually doing these tours and and these shows for American troops? What if they'd actually put him on the front line and then he died? How disparaging would that be? How terrible would that be uh, for Americans to wake up and read that the great Joe Lewis, who had defeated what they considered to be, uh, although it's unfair most likely to the man himself, but what they considered to be Hitler's champion, Joe Lewis, who had defeated Hitler's champion, uh, was now dead, shot dead by um, by a Nazi's bullet. Or at that point, it, um, the conflict might have been in the Pacific more. I'm not entirely sure. I'm no historian um, when it you know, comes to anything. Uh, I just happen to know some history about things that interest me. But the headlines that would have been generated by these heroes of the nations, uh, heroes of the nation dying, would not have been near worth it for the American government. And so they kept, uh, they kept these guys away from harm and they kept them healthy and happy and they were more more uh, morale boosters and interestingly enough joe lewis really disapproved of muhammad ali's decision but joe lewis's uh which is such an interesting take for him to have because joe lewis was massively mistreated by the american uh by certain actors i should say in the, in the american government joe lewis held uh held I wouldn't call it charity, but he, he he held these bouts that he gave that were for that were for raising money for the war effort. So Joe Lewis would give his entire purse away to the American government. And what the American government decided to do was look at this not as charity, but um, as as prize matches and whether he gave away the money or not. They said he owed thousands upon thousands of dollars and the interest accrued would later mean that he he owed hundreds of thousands of dollars. And Joe Lewis lived at times um, destitute. This great champion was now destitute and, and just owed more than he could ever hope to pay off uh, had he lived a thousand years. And if you look at his last boxing matches, most of them are to pay off the IRS. But he even with these matches, um, he couldn't pay it off in as quickly as the interest was accruing and eventually a deal was was worked out but at the time that muhammad ali was refusing to be drafted joe lewis was being forced to work as a greeter in uh, a las vegas hotel so that was such an interesting perspective for him to have but another person who made their perspective very clear from the very beginning was joe frazier uh who said, you know, a boxer shouldn't be getting involved in politics. There's no reason for him to be doing that. And he, he said that immediately uh, after it had just happened in an interview and said it very clearly. It wasn't even the question the interviewer was asking. He just asked, what do you think of Muhammad Ali as in, would you like to fight him? And uh, Frazier immediately gave his opinion uh, on, on what he felt, how he felt it was not right for him to to. Uh, to be an objector, to not be drafted. And J Joe Frazier would stick with this opinion throughout the entirety of his life. To quote Joe Frazier from before uh, his fight with Ali was ever announced, I'd like to button his big mouth once and for all. I think the public is fed up with his fussin' and fumin'. What kind of a man is this who doesn't want to fight for his country? If he was in Russia or someplace else, they'd put him up against the wall. He walks around like he's one kind of a big hero, but he's just a phony, a disgrace. End quote. So, for someone who didn't want this to become a war of 
ideals, and I truly believe he didn't, Frazier rose to the occasion of what Muhammad Ali was saying, and in some cases did this preemptively, even when these things were not addressed directly at Frazier. I think something Frazier took a lot of issue with was that Muhammad Ali kept calling himself the real champion. Uh, because, of course, he'd never been defeated. His license was taken, was taken away from him right after his fight with uh, Zora Foley, and he still considered himself the, le the legitimate heavyweight champion of the world, and he was, of course, the lineal heavyweight champion of the world. And he was saying this, though, before Joe Frazier ever won a title, or uh, before he won a title, I should say, that solidified him as heavyweight champion of the world. So it wasn't, these, these things were not directed at the beginning directly at Joe Frazier. They were, of course, later, and Frazier chose to, to comment on them beforehand. And this gave Ali all the ammunition he needed uh, to really just drag Joe Frazier through the dirt and establish him as a traitor to the civil rights movement, uh, as a contrarian to those who did not like uh, the death toll and all the other terribleness that came from the Vietnam War. Uh, and as he called him an Uncle Tom, which at that point was pretty much one of the worst things uh, that one black man could call another black man. Basically saying, you work for white people, you've made yourself a slave. So compared to these things that Muhammad Ali was saying, this cultural war that he was forcing upon Frazier, the things he normally said about his opponents, that they were ugly or slow or couldn't fight or weren't pretty like him, uh, were pretty much irrelevant. They did anger Frazier and they did get to Frazier, but they didn't impact his psyche or his family or his standing in the community in the same way that these two issues did uh, with Frazier. What I think what really got to Frazier, though, is that he felt he had far more of a right to talk about these things, or that he'd experienced these things that Muhammad Ali was talking about far more than Ali ever had. Uh, Frazier was born in a poverty-ridden neighborhood. He would worked as a janitor while he was boxing, uh, and was only able to get that work part-time. And upon his return from the Olympics, he had to take a job uh, packaging meat in a slaughterhouse. And what's fascinating is that before it became popular uh, with the movie Rocky, you know, remember Rocky Balboa hitting those slabs of meat and how that was supposed to be like, uh, oh, look how, look how brutal he is, this guy's serious. Joe Frazier actually did that far before the movie ever came out, which of course makes it way more ironic that... Rocky Balboa, the fictitious character, got a statue in Philadelphia before Joe Frazier ever did. He actually did get one only within the last few years. So by the time Frazier was sitting in that locker room, waiting for the fight of the century to start, waiting to finally get his hands on Muhammad Ali, he'd had every part of who he was questioned, defiled, dragged through the mud. And for him, he'd reached his breaking point. To him, this man was not a man. This man was a demon who'd come to destroy his life. Frazier had really been thrown into a world that he wasn't prepared for. This wasn't a boxing match. This was a cultural war. And Ali had painted him as the villain, the man who needed to be defeated so that the righteous man could stand in his place and be named king. And this is what many people believed, that Frazier was just a terrible person standing in the way of all of society, pretty much. Standing in the way of the progress of society. And so Frazier had had questioned everything that he'd ever believed himself to be by Muhammad Ali. And a number of people... In fact, I'd say the majority of people in his community and the people he knew had asked those same questions that Muhammad Ali had and answered 
For Fraser, without truly asking him, yes, you are what Muhammad Ali says you to be. You are standing in the way of progress. You are an Uncle Tom. And that's why Fraser asked God, please help me kill this man. He's not righteous. Years later, Muhammad Ali would describe what his feelings were on Joe Frazier in his book. I'd always given nicknames to my opponents to help sell tickets and make everyone interested in the fight. But with Frazier, I went too far, and tension between us escalated until he really disliked me. Joe made me fight harder than I ever thought I could. He was a formidable opponent, whose skills I will always respect. But I had hurt Joe Frazier in more ways than one, and I didn't realize at the time how my words and actions impacted his family. It was never my intention to hurt them. For that, I'm sorry. And as kind of, I think, a final apology, Muhammad Ali actually wrote Joe Frazier a poem. And it's very long, and I'm not going to read all of it. But if you choose to read it, you could kind of see that... Ali really did admire, deeply admire Joe Frazier. And Muhammad Ali believed that both him and Frazier, in the end, helped each other to rise to heights they couldn't have without the other. And of course, I'm not entirely sure Frazier believed this, but nonetheless, it's true. Um, these guys really brought out the best, and have many people, as many people have mentioned, the absolute worst. <laughs> at times, in each other. And this one fight and the symbolism behind it and the personal connection it had between the two fighters really is one of the most fascinating kind of aspects of not just American history and world history, but also the history of combat sports or martial arts in general. So I would encourage everyone to learn a little bit more about it. Uh, I read couple of books and a lot of articles and watched a lot of interviews for this. Uh, Soul of a Butterfly by Muhammad Ali is very good, and it kind of describes the inner, turmoil he, uh, the inner turmoil he was going through uh, with his own beliefs. And, and uh, he always seemed so sure of himself in interviews, but uh, he, he clearly didn't have all the answers. So it's a fascinating book, and, uh, and really kind of he goes in, into a lot of a lot of the personal things he was going through and his own convictions. I read The Fight of the Century, which I felt was a little biased towards Frazier, but not much. Uh, it, it, was a, it was overall a very good book and interesting and got into the... If you liked The uh, Four Kings, you, you definitely liked this book. It has some good behind-the-scenes kind of stuff. Uh, the descriptions of the fights aren't near as good or as in-depth as The Four Kings. Uh, I will be chronicling all three fights. There will be breakdowns of them. I felt I wanted to do this because there were there's so many interesting tidbits uh, in a kind of historical context that I wasn't able to really I won't be able to go into when I break down the fights. Those are mostly going to be kept, for the most part, um, about the techniques instead of the men uh, behind the fighting, and instead of the the social the societal context of it. So. Um, those are coming out. I just wanted to, to put this out because I felt there was a lot of fa fascinating stuff to talk about with it. Uh, I'll be back to normal podcasts next week, although I, I might eventually do something like this again if, if there's an interesting enough topic uh, to, to go into. And I wasn't, while the fights this past weekend were good, they weren't particularly amazing and I didn't feel like talking about them near as much as I felt like talking about this. So stay tuned for the fight of the century and then eventually the other two fights between Muhammad Ali and Frazier after those. And uh, until then, happy training.